Are you having a hard time figuring out what to get dad for Father's Day? You should check out Row One Brand's Vintage Pictorum Gallery. They have America's best sports art. With over 7,200 historic sports prints, you're assured to find something unique for dad this Father's Day. Instead of a boring old tie, get him a historic baseball photo taken by Henry High Sandum at the historic Polo Ground Stadium in New York City during the 1894 Temple Cup. Or, if he's an NFL buff, check out the 1963 vintage NFL poster. These are so good looking that you'll be amazed how they turn out. Shop now at sportshistorynetwork.com slash row one and save 15% off your order. This is Basketball History 101 with Rick Loiza. Welcome back to Basketball History 101, part of the Sports History Network. I am your host, Rick Loiza. This is the podcast where we bring to life some of the forgotten stories from basketball history. And today we bring you an NBA Finals bonus episode. With the finals getting started tonight between the Phoenix Suns and the Milwaukee Bucks, I thought what better time than now to bring you this short story from the 1952 NBA Finals. I had this story sitting on the list I maintain of episode ideas, but as I dug into the story, there really was not enough there to do a full episode on it. It is a great story, but a short one. So let me get right into it. The 1952 NBA Finals were between the Minneapolis Lakers and the New York Knicks. Minneapolis had home court advantage and the honor of hosting Game 1 at their arena. In front of a full crowd of 8,722 fans, the championship series would get started. The Lakers had four Hall of Famers on their roster in George Mikan, Jim Pollard, Vern Mickelson, and Slater Martin. They were a loaded squad. Even their coach was a Hall of Fame coach, John Kundla. The Knicks were also stacked. They had three Hall of Fame players in Dick McGuire, Harry Gallatin, and Nat Sweetwater Clifton. On their bench, they had a backup player by the name of Al McGuire, who was Dick McGuire's little brother. Al McGuire was a future Hall of Fame coach who led Marquette University to the 1977 NCAA Championship. But on this day, he was a backup player. The next coach was another Hall of Famer, Joe Lapchick, who played for the original Celtics back in the 1920s and 1930s. Lapchick is in the Hall of Fame as a player. So, between all the players and coaches, there were 10 Hall of Famers involved in this game. Al McGuire was by no means a star player for the Knicks. His job was to come in and give his big brother a break. Al was not a primary offensive option. He was to play defense and create havoc until his brother was ready to come back into the game. But Al was shooting early and late in the first quarter, he took a shot as he was getting fouled. At the time, the Knicks were up 13-9 when Al drives the lane and took a hard shot from one of the Lakers. As Al was stumbling, he threw the ball at the rim without even looking at it. The ball went in, but the referees did not see it. Even Al did not see it. He was too busy getting up and yelling at the referees, that's a foul. He did not need to convince the referees because they agreed it was a foul. But in the commotion of Al's yelling, they did not look at the ball. They were looking at Al. According to the Knicks player, Ernie Vandeway, the ball hit the backboard, then the front of the rim, bounced a couple of more times before finally falling in. The fans saw it, most of the Knicks saw it, the Lakers even saw it, but the Lakers were not going to say anything. Over 8,000 people in the arena saw what happened. But the two people that mattered the most, the referees, completely missed the shot. So instead of counting the basket and giving Al one free throw, the shot did not count. So Al was going to shoot two free throws for getting fouled in the act of shooting. And he missed the first free throw. Joe Lapchick, the Knicks coach, was pleading with the referees to check with the scorer's table, or check with the reporters, or check with anyone. Back then, the NBA only had two referees for any game. Today, they have three referees to help cover more ground, but not back then. The head referee was Sid Borgia, probably one of the two or three greatest referees in NBA history. Borgia is in the Hall of Fame as a referee. Yes, that is such a thing. Now, just like some players are better than others, like Will Chamberlain, Kobe Bryant, Larry Bird, or Shaquille O'Neal, some referees are also better than others. 
and Borgia was one of the best, but he missed seeing the ball go in. The Knicks tried to shake it off and keep working to win the game. At the end of four quarters, the score was tied 71 to 71. If the referees had seen that basket, then the Knicks would have won the game. Instead, they went to overtime, where the Lakers controlled the overtime period and came away with an 83-79 victory to take Game 1 of the NBA Finals. The Lakers won the whole series as it went to a full 7 games, where the Lakers won 4 games to 3. If those referees had seen the ball go in, then the Knicks probably win Game 1 and probably win the whole series 4 games to 3. If video replay existed back then, then the Knicks probably would have been the 1952 NBA champions. Instead, it was the Lakers who walked away with their third NBA championship. For the Knicks, it would be 18 more years before they would win their first one in 1970 with completely different players and coaches. But it does go to show you that sometimes an entire season can be decided by just a single play. Well, there's your bonus episode. Have fun watching the NBA Finals. And one last bit of useless trivia. Back in the fall of 1968, the NBA brought in two brand new expansion teams. Those two teams were the Phoenix Suns and the Milwaukee Bucks. I want to thank my producer and editor, Jacob Loiza. Join us next time as we continue to mine the history of basketball for more great stories from the past. Take care and see you soon. We here at the Sports History Network proudly partner with 26 podcasts, all revolving around the history of sports. But did you know that many of our hosts were sports history authors way before they started their shows? It's true. We've got Joe Ziemba, host of When Football Was Football. Joe Zagurski, host of Pro Football in the 1970s. Mark Morthier, host of Yesterday Sports. Tommy Phillips, host of Lombardi Memories, and Scott Adamson, co-host of From the 55-Yard Line. All these authors have many books for you to choose from. To check them out, go to our website at sportshistorynetwork.com slash sportshistorybooks. Pick up your copy today! Soundtrack provided by Kevin McLeod of filmmusic.io.